Rebellion, Chapter 19, Interlude Minus 21. I awoke to Joffrey shaking me awake, eyes wide with worry and shock. Blearily, I peered about. Two maids huddled by the door, each pale and grim-looking. Joffrey himself looked wild-eyed, his dress not entirely as put together I was used to. The maids must have woken him or interrupted his usual morning rituals. Thank the seven. Thank the seven. Where is Girardis? His shout made me flinch and I cursed myself when he turned back to me, looking stricken. There was no way he hadn't felt me jump with his hands still on my shoulder. The maids fled at his shout, leaving me alone with him. Head foggy with sleep, I pulled myself out of bed and staggered over to the juice the maids had evidently been in the process of bringing. Your grace, he asked, voice fearful. I ignored him in favor of downing as much juice as possible. My throat ached, making the act of swallowing painful. Annoyed, I raised my hand to it and rubbed at it as if I could erase last night. The door swung open to admit Girardis, the maester was panting as if he had run all the way from his rooms. When he saw me he stopped dead, then his eyes went lower and widened with horror. Your grace. Please lie back down and allow me to attend to you, he all but babbled. I finished my cup and couldn't quite keep the grimace off of my face. I am fine, I lied, pain in my throat flaring as I spoke. I felt a hand on my shoulder, steering me to the bed. Your grace, someone has tried to strangle you. Girardis sounded somewhat hysterical so I allowed him to steer me to the bed. I didn't let him force me to lie down but I put up with his tests, even if it was embarrassing to have Joffrey in the corner whilst he poked and prodded. After he left, Joffrey removed himself from the wall and stepped forward, falling to his knees in front of me. Your grace, I have failed you. Is it really that bad? I rasped, wincing as I realized that if I was having trouble speaking it most certainly was. He raised his dark eyes and stared at me incredulously. Your grace, the maids thought you dead. Strangled in your sleep. He looked stricken and upset. I sighed and closed my eyes, hands trying to massage away a headache. I don't know how he thought I'd been injured but he was clearly blaming himself. I am as well as can be expected. You may consider yourself innocent of any failing, the man who did this was one beyond your reach. I couldn't quite bring myself to say it was Viserys. I had never seen him like that. I knew he had a temper, had seen it directed at Damon and various courtiers but... Gods, never at me and never that bad. Joffrey was silent for some time as his eyes flickered this way and that, trying to figure out who I meant. I knew he'd hit on the right answer when his eyes widened and his face contorted into horror. I believe I understand, your grace. I will have the castle prepared to accommodate your return, he told me, face neutral and tone unfriendly. He was almost stalking as he left, free hand going for a sword he no longer wore. There was the knight of kisses, the man willing to fight a princess over the prince. The man willing to fight a king over a princess. He reached the door before I called out to him. Do not do anything rash, Sir Joffrey, he nodded, eyes conveying his rage and unhappiness. I rose once to change into a night shirt with the help of the maids before falling back to sleep. I felt heavy and drained and tired but no amount of rest seemed able to drive it away. I should get up and attend to Dragonstone, I likely had a stack of reports to make my way through. I should get up and go see Wisdom Jarrett and how he is coming along with the Guild Campus. I should get up and find Joffrey to plan how I would remain in contact with the Blacks whilst I found myself unwelcome at court. I had taken a bad situation and gotten close to salvaging it and then thrown it all away because my temper had gotten the better of me once again. The Renner and me had gotten the better of me once again. He knew, he knew what Damon had done to me, knew that the rumors Alicent had spread weren't true. Just as he knew that the rumors regarding Alicent were true. That she had entered the relationship willingly and had been quite charmed by him for the longest time. To conflate the two situations. I dashed away my tears and gave in to the sudden exhaustion I felt. I awoke to feather light touches skimming over my face, tracing the curve of my cheek, before moving down and settling on my neck. I opened my eyes in confusion. Lena hung over me, cascades of silver ringlets curtaining her face. Her face bore an intense expression and her eyes were full of rage I had never seen in the girl before. In the low light of my room she was hauntingly beautiful in a way that caused my heart to lurch painfully and my mouth go dry. Realizing I was awake, she snatched her hand back as if burned before favoring me with a small smile. That rage didn't quite leave her eyes though. Sick bed or not, I'm not kissing you, she said and I bit back a groan. Of course she'd noticed. She was only ever observant when it was inconvenient for her to be. Lena, 
came Joffrey's voice, sharp with warning. A joke, Sir Joffrey, one cannot be serious all the time. Besides, I am the least likely to judge her proclivities. I pushed past her and pulled myself halfway to upright, leaning against the impressively carved headboard. A dragon wing poked my cheek. Lena shifted her position on the bed as I pulled at the covers and tried to smile, managing to look vaguely constipated. She seemed to be struggling to remove her gaze from my neck. She was still dressed in her riding gear and smelt of dragon and sea salt. Joffrey looked as grim as ever and still just as angry as he had when he had left this morning. I risked a glance out the window and was surprised to find it pitch black outside. Had I really slept the whole day away? My proclivities. I croaked, questioningly. Joffrey sighed. My dolt of a brother thought you wanted me in your bed. Flattering, I suppose, she told me. This time I could see the look Joffrey cast at her, full of frustration. Lena, this is not the time for japes. Oh come on, Joff, both she and my brother have, inconvenient desires. You can't deny hiding it will be the most important thing you do. Her grace is loyal to your brother, Joffrey told her as I resigned myself to a painfully awkward conversation. But even if she were not, now would not be the time to have this conversation. Her grace very much desires the company of her husband and has taken no lovers, he continued after giving Lena time to process that information. Of any sort. Sir Joffrey, I am going to do something very nice for you in the future. Although at least she isn't full of pity. I don't think I could handle pity right now. Oh by the seven. I beg your apologies, I must have sounded as vain as Dash. I waved her apology off, feeling only slightly guilty at the deceit. Gods, it had been so odd to realize my sexuality had shifted. I had thought myself past surprises like that when I awoke in Renera's body but 14 years and the start of puberty later and I found my blood singing for a man. Awkward to explain to the sister-in-law. Now that we've established I'm not a sexual harassment case waiting to happen, why are you here? Sexual harassment, she asked, frowning. A term her grace coined during her creation of the bureaucracy of Dragonstone. It's quite simple to parse its meaning. Perhaps you could give her grace the news from the capital. The urge to laugh ran through me. Lena was clever in her own way, the best dragon rider of our generation and if Rainies ever let her would make an excellent explorer but when it came to anything not dragons or flying, she could be remarkably ditzy. Case in point, accusing the crown princess of having an affair as a joke. The sad thing was that if she ever bothered to focus on politics she'd probably be very good at it, she understood people well when she bothered to. Oh. Laner sent me ahead to tell you. Rumors abound in the capital of your falling out with the king and Laner wanted to make sure your lords knew that it was over the Vale business. Regardless, Lord Gerald is in a fine temper and even the Greens are discontent about the fact you have been unofficially banished over defending the rights of a vassal. And? Joffrey prompted. Lena rolled her eyes. Something told me Laner had drilled this into his sister's head repeatedly before letting her go, something about her wording was reminiscent of him. And Viserys issued a decree supporting every action you took, including the seizure of Gulltown. You have nearly the entire court in your corner and the small folk praising your name from Cracklaw Point to the Wendwater. With no way to turn that goodwill into solid political gains, I reminded them both. Laner says it's not so. Lord Gerald is taking the lead with the Black Faction in King's Landing and many of your supporters have spoken about sending representatives to Dragonstone for your own court here and that's just the court's reaction. Once the Lords Paramount hear the news there will be a second wave of condemnation for the King. Then I trust Lord Gerald to handle it. At my dismissal, Lena and Joffrey shot each other surprised glances. That is, unlike you. Lena said, her eyes worried. Her grace is not well currently. Certainly once she has recovered she will resume her position in charge of the Black Faction. She is in the room, Joffrey. I said as I laid back down and punched my pillow into a vaguely comfortable shape. And she is going back to sleep. Uh, there may be a small problem, Lena's tone was hesitant, as if she had bad news and suspected the messenger might very much get shot for delivering it. A sigh escaped me before I could stop it. Go ahead, ruin my evening. Mother is here. Lena said very quickly. I felt her weight leave the bed. I glared at my pillow. If Rainies were here it was a minor miracle hadn't stormed my bedroom already. I thought it prudent to allow Lena to warn you rather than allow Lady Rainies to enter with you unaware. Joffrey, I don't know how you did it but I'm going to make you tell me. Lady Rainies respects the laws of neither men nor gods, how did you get her to restrain herself for so long? 
I sat up again and glared at the worried-looking Lena and the ever-stoic Joffrey. Then it seems I must get dressed and receive Lady Rainey's before she lays siege to my rooms. Mother isn't that bad, Renera, Lena chuckled nervously. I shot her a dark look. Perhaps you can help her grace dress herself. I will ensure that Lady Rainey's is aware that you will be attending to her shortly. I couldn't be bothered with fashion and dress cuts so I asked Lena to find me a dress that wasn't completely terrible and let her do most of the work when it came to pulling it on. It was clumsy and much slower than I really expected but then again, Lena had hardly played lady-in-waiting or maid before. Renera, are you truly well, she asked me softly as I dug around for something to conceal my neck with. I'd looked into what passed as a mirror and discovered why everyone was so concerned. My neck was riot of deep purple and blue, a very clear hand print dominated it. I didn't bother answering her as I located a long red shawl and occupied myself with wrapping it about my neck. She sighed in annoyance at my silence but took my proffered arm. Rainey's was pacing the room when we finally got there, an untouched glass of wine on the low table she was supposed to be sitting at. When we entered she crossed the room and seized me by the shoulder, violet eyes studying me. Heard from my boy and half the court you flung yourself into two sieges, broke a quarantine and had a mighty row with Viserys over it all. It wasn't a question but a statement so I merely nodded. She turned to her daughter. How bad? Laner says that dash. No, Lena. How bad is whatever wound she's hiding? Lena's eyes flickered between me and her mother, caught between a rock and a hard place, I realized. Don't give me that look, something she did sent Viserys into a frenzy and I doubt it was catching this non-existent plague. I was not wounded in the veil, Rainies, I told her, then regretted it because my voice was still rough and painful. Rainies turned back to me, mouth set into an unhappy curl. Show her, Renera. Traitor. I glared at Lena who merely looked stricken. Trust me, you are not leaving until I have a whole accounting of whatever idiocy you and Viserys have managed to argue your way into. I glared at her. Viserys was the idiot, not me. He was the one that refused to see reason, refused to see that his belief that family was family and would never harm you would end in mine or Aegon's death. I removed the shawl and Rainey's actually growled in anger. What? Happened, she managed to choke out after a moment. Her face was mottled white and red with rage and her hands bawling repeatedly into fists. Viserys was unhappy with my work in the Vale. He believed it to be an extension of the factionalism I have apparently caused and stirred up. He told me Alicent would never see me harmed and I told him Alicent hates me because she thinks I took Damon from her. Rainey's groaned in dismay. Renera, you know how he rea dash. It's true. She was fucking him and he broke it off because he wanted to be closer to the throne than Alicent could get him. In the corner of my eye I could see Lena looking thrilled. She probably hadn't heard this gossip before and if she had, she probably hadn't had it confirmed as completely true. Viserys had always come down hard on those that repeated the rumors. I know that. You know that. Half of King's Landing bloody well knows that. Viserys blinds himself to it willingly and reacts badly when people make him confront it. Then she sighed and dropped into the chair. That being said I should think he was more angry about you throwing yourself headfirst into danger. That man. If it were not for my husband's promise I'd be in court by morn and would have answers from him. A flicker of alarm shot through me and even Lena moved to confront her mother, who merely held up a hand. I will not do anything rash. Mark my words though, that man is going to get a reckoning soon. If I had thought Rainey's and Lena's reactions to be unduly angry, Laner proved me wrong. He'd arrived back accompanying my ladies and the ships having initiated a graceful exit from King's Landing and appointing Lord Celtigar and Lord Gerald as the nominal black leaders in our absence. That the king had banished me for my actions in the Vale had been explained to him by Viserys himself who'd wrung his hands and listed the fact I had cared little for the plague warning, risked death by twitchy mercenaries, gotten caught up in two sieges and generally put myself at risk as the reason he'd been so angry. He'd reasoned that if I stayed at Dragonstone and ruled there it would be just as effective at showing the realm I could be heir than turning up at court at battling Alicent for influence over the lords. Funnily enough, he'd failed to mention the choking. So Laner had docked in Dragonstone and been greeted by his mother, his sister, and his wife. Rainey's had waited until Laner had finished his explanation of his meeting with Viserys before pulling the shawl from my neck revealing the still ugly bruising. Lena had been forced to wrestle her brother to the ground to prevent him from flying sea smoke straight back to King's Landing in a rage. Ha! Huh. I was starting to have my doubts I'd ever see you in a dragon rage, Laner, she cackled, after he'd calmed down enough for Lena to stop sitting on him. One could almost hear the capital letters. 
Dragon Rage? Really? I asked Drilly for my position behind a large glass of wine. This sounded like an interesting tidbit of lore. Hadn't Viserys often blathered about waking the dragon in canon? Don't tell me you've never had it explained to you, Renera. Rhaenys asked before throwing her head back and laughing. Of course you haven't, Emma wouldn't have known and Viserys wouldn't have cared. Those of us bonded to dragons are vulnerable to rages beyond that of normal men, explained Lena, shooting an amused look at her brother. Laner flushed. That, actually explained a lot. Holy shit, why hadn't Viserys ever mentioned this? At my presumably stunned expression, Rainey's laughed again. I've seen you with it. You haven't got the handle on it that you think you do, but it'll come with age. As for my girl, there's a reason Corlys doesn't argue with her these days. I seem to remember an invitation to talk to Vagar about your frequent travels. Mother! Lena exclaimed, horrified. I had never seen Lena truly angry beyond the brief flash of murder she'd had over the bruises when she'd first seen them. Apparently, it wasn't something I should seek out if even Corlys was wary of it. But it seems the only thing that'll get Laner fired up is a pretty wife in peril. Your father's son in more ways than one. There was a fierce grin gracing the queen that never was face. Laner went even redder, hands twisting the hem of his tunic. I allowed myself to enjoy the sight of him, red blush on high cheekbones, for a moment until I caught Lena watching me with a raised eyebrow and an odd expression. Rainey's was wrong, of course, about the cause being a wife in peril. I had seen Laner truly beyond rage, filled with killing intent, as we'd waited for the maester to finish looking over Joffrey. Laner had wanted to challenge Kristen Cole, had wanted him dead and not peacefully in his sleep either. It had been the desire to make sure Joffrey did not awaken alone that had prevented him storming the royal apartments to confront the Lord Commander. I certainly had nothing to do with it, he'd barely acknowledged my presence at the time. No doubt we'll be receiving your father's judgment on all of this before long, said Rainey's, merrily and oblivious to her children's suddenly chagrined expressions. I, myself, refused to allow my expression to change. Corlys could fall in line or continue sulking on those fucking islands but I was done with men telling me what to do, assuming they were better at it all simply because I lacked a cock and they didn't. Corlys did indeed have opinions. Surprising ones. His letter praised Laner for his actions in the Vale, both in being a leader of men and flying in the fall of Gulltown. He'd also waxed lyrical about how proud he was that Laner had managed to use my foolishness to create a boon for House Valerion in the form of men, trade and resources from the Vale. He'd approved Laner's offers of the loans to Jane and given him permission to sink a princely amount into the new enterprise in the Vale. I don't think Laner was supposed to read aloud the bit where Corlys implied I was an empty-headed chit who needed to be kept from harming myself through my own moronic ideas. Clearly, someone had received notice that Joffrey succeeded in emptying Dragonstone of his spies and was not taking it very well. Joffrey had also succeeded in the other task I had set him because it seemed Carl Corey was gone. No body, no scandal, no real rumors, he was just gone. Joffrey had been tight-lipped about what he'd done even when I'd confronted him directly. I had no clue if he was dead or alive, if he'd left willingly or not, if he even knew why he'd been turfed out of his comfy life on Driftmark. I found myself troubled by how untroubled I was by Carl Corey's unknown fate. He was probably dead. Likely executed, no, not executed, murdered for a crime he might commit in the future on the orders of a man who simply had another's word of his untrustworthiness. My word. At least Laner hadn't been too upset. He'd sulked for a day or two but had snapped out of it the moment Joffrey reported that Wisdom Jarrett had begun research and testing on Dragonstone. I admit I was excited too. Jarrett had split his wisdoms into groups, roughly following the groups Laner had used initially with a few minor changes. Wisdom Hugh had taken command of a few farms close to the campus in my name and had started the experiments. They'd given one farmer the tools they'd produced, one farmer the idea and process of the four-field system, the third both the field system and the tools and final one had been told to keep farming as usual. Wisdom Gone had been given charge of the communications research. A fancy word for what was essentially just the printing press and the vague idea of typewriter. I was told he'd made good progress though. He'd come up with several promising prototypes for the press itself but had run into a problem with the actual print part. Wisdom Baron had started his experiments into glass which were not going as well as hoped. Clear glass was still out of our reach it seemed as my vague ideas about seaweed were just that. Vague. Still, we were learning a lot about the different types of seaweed that graced the waters around Dragonstone and Driftmark and learning was never bad. The final research group of any note was not lead by a wisdom but by Maester Girardis. 
Girardis was a gifted healer and had read only a few pages of the book before insisting he be allowed to work with the Wisdoms. I had been worried he'd sell us all out and tell the Maesters about my plans but he'd insisted he was loyal to me. He'd done that in canon. I remembered where it had got him there. I'd begrudgingly allowed it because in the end he was the best man for the job. None of the Wisdoms really knew much about the body and medicine and Girardis did have multiple silver links. So far, I did not think my trust had been misplaced even if he had sulked regarding my insistence that he train midwives. He'd given in after an afternoon spent arguing with me when he'd realized I wasn't backing down. He'd sought out a few young girls from the castle town and begun teaching them how to read and write. After that he promised to teach them basic biology and bring in an older midwife to go over the finer points of delivering a baby. Then they'd be dispatched to gain experience on Dragonstone and Driftmark before returning to be present at my own birth. Hopefully with the crown princess favoring them, their popularity would soon justify training more. Still, Girardis wasn't entirely focused on training midwives. He'd successfully created ether which was, admittedly, not as useful as it could be in a world with milk of the poppy but apparently still a worthy breakthrough in the field of medicine. He'd also produced a few stethoscope prototypes alongside some of the apprentices. He was very excited about the stethoscope. He'd devoted himself to researching all of the ways the stethoscope could be incorporated into the diagnosis process. Honestly, with all the testing he'd been doing the people of Dragonstone had never been healthier and I'd never been more popular as it seems the small folk had interpreted my maester homing in on anyone with so much as a cough or a sniffle like a heat-seeking missile as a sign of my exceedingly charitable nature. At least the success of the stethoscope was balancing out the continued lack of progress of the penicillin front. Girardis had done some research and discovered that early first men included fruit mold in many of their ointments and poultices which did point to the spore existing but that damn thing remained elusive. Wisdom Jarrett watched over it all, diving in and out of tasks and research as fancy took him. He'd been appointed as the leader of the alchemists I had lured away from the capital. Not surprising given the pages had been secured by his actions but I made a point of asking Joffrey to ensure that we did not become embroiled in any intraguild politics. It would be a pain to lose progress because Jarrett wanted to argue about which hat he got to wear. Speaking of politics, Joffrey and Laner had been right. Viserys' actions had put him massively on the back foot with his courtiers and lords. He'd been forced to excessively praise my efforts to defend Jane's rights to all that would listen after an outpouring of support for me and condemnation at my perceived punishment. It was also a complete mystery how descriptions of what Viserys had done to me had dispersed about the capital, wasn't it, Joffrey? To say nothing of the actual, honest to the seven public denouncement Rainies decided to send out to every lord that would listen, which hadn't helped Viserys' position, as it had simply confirmed Joffrey's rumors. Oh yes, my dear father was very unpopular in the capital right now. Although practically speaking, I was the only one actually popular in the capital right now. Some of the Greens had begun wavering, wondering if their rights would be defended given that Alicent was doubling down on condemning me. Not that she had a choice, Joffrey was quick to tell me that the Greens were suffering from backlash from, well, actually nobody was sure. Soon after my departure, Viserys and Alicent had a terrible row over what Joffrey did not know but it had taken days for them to begin speaking to one another again. I must admit to being impressed she'd managed to come up with a half-decent party line for her greens to line up behind. She'd taken the view that it had been an internal dispute in the Vale and that I had overstepped my rights as princess and heir when I'd interfered without anyone asking me to. Hardcore greens were obediently parroting it to all who would listen whilst implying I would weaken the rights of the Lord's Paramount to strengthen myself unjustly. Unfortunately, only her most hardcore greens were buying it. Truly, the greens were definitely in worse shape than I would have expected, losing royal favor and lucrative appointments left, right and center viseries may not be appointing my blacks in their place but Alison's hold on the capital was shakier than it had been in years. In fact, even viseries' latest and greatest idea seemed to be an extension of green disfavor when taken in the context of the court. Oh yes, viseries had apparently had another stroke of genius because a letter had been sent to Dragonstone bearing the king's seal. The letter was typical of his missives. He acknowledged that his hasty reaction to my actions in the Vale had been ill-considered and divisive. He informed me of the reasons he'd reacted so which mostly boiled down to the fact he'd been scared stiff I would get myself killed. He praised my sense of justice, my political sense and my quick wit for solving the Vale situation in a manner that had been uncommonly light on casualties for succession disputes. He confirmed that he still thought of me as his heir and that if I continued showing such qualities as I did, I would be a finer ruler than Jaehaerys and a worthy queen for Westeros. But not once did he apologize. Not once did he say sorry for physically attacking me, for shouting and throwing his weight around. 
There was no rescinding of my informal banishment, and that said more to me than his entire letter had. Still, if it had just been the praise, the support, and the new confirmation he still saw me as his heir it would have been an annoying letter I could point to later when someone got snotty with me but this was Viserys. Viserys who seemed to be innately gifted in making every situation he ever got involved in objectively worse. I had to hand it to him though, this time he wasn't making my life worse. Or rather, he wasn't making it directly worse, I had no doubt Alicent was thinking of a thousand different ways to make me pay for this. Viserys had decreed that Helena was old enough to be sent to foster. And he'd chosen me, her doting older sister. I really, really want to know what Alicent did to piss him off. She watched the paper that lay on her desk as one might watch a live viper and toyed with her glass of wine. She didn't need to read it to know what it said, she'd read through it enough to know the words by heart now. Empty-headed fool. What was he thinking? She knew of course. He was arrogant enough to not realize he'd lost control of the situation long ago. That everyone involved would dance to his tune. She took a sip of wine and glared at the fire in the grate. She had never danced to his tune and woe betide him if he thought she would not catch on to his game. That he would try and sell their daughter, their only daughter, to such a man. Oh he used such coy language opining it would be good for them to meet and that Renera's influence had to be fought and so on, playing to what he knew to be her insecurities. The wine glass came down to hard on the table, splashing its contents over her hand. Did he think her a fool? Did he think he could control Damon the way he thought he could control Laner and Lena? He couldn't even control the daughter of that bleeding sheep on the throne, how could he think he could control a true dragon? In truth, he couldn't even control their children anymore. Her boy, a boy no more, married for nearly a year now. He'd been to war, fought and killed. He was out in the world making his own name, forging his own legend. That he was doing at the side of that girl was the only infuriating part. She seemed content to sit back and let her precious boy sow all the hard work. Money for an army, bat your eyelids at Laner. Money for bizarre experiments, earn it on your back from Laner. And as for the spies on Driftmark. Stupid boy. Why had he not warned them that Lon Mouth, another ungrateful bastard, had men crawling over the island? Her husband had taught Joffrey everything he knew, treated him like a second son, and he repaid them with betrayal. More to the point, why had she been such a fool to assume that after that stunt her husband had pulled with their spies that Renera would not return the favor? That Laner had not told her galled her. His wife had bought out half his island and he had not cared to even try and even hint about them. Too much like his father, she supposed, all Renera had to do was play the wounded doe and Laner had done the rest. Cunning. Clever. It should reassure her that their future queen had a brain in her head. She sighed. She was being too harsh on the girl. To wound up, to worried for her children. She was seeing threats in every corner. Renera wasn't that bad. By her side, Laner had become something more. Gone was the cowering boy, afraid of everything. Now he was a man in truth, soon to have babes on the way with any luck. A knock on the door roused her from her thoughts. Come in, she barked placing her wine glass to the side and wiping her hand on the black tunic she wore. Lena appeared in the doorway, looking worried and she gave her a warm smile. Come in, girl, come in. She poured them both some wine and waited as her daughter made herself comfortable before handing her the cup. Thank you mother. I wanted to speak to you about, about the stepstones, her voice was hesitant, as if she expected her to end the conversation there and then. I don't think I should go. It doesn't feel right and Laner sigh dash. Laner might as well be one of those fancy mimic birds from the Summer Islands right now. Renera doesn't want to risk you bringing Damon back to Westeros. Her daughter flushed at the rebuke. Lena certainly approved of the girl as well. She hadn't seen her daughter so keen to stay in one place since she'd been a child, since she'd clambered across the back of Vagar and claimed the gargantuan beast for her own. Renera said he would want me because I'm beautiful and he likes to possess beautiful things. The defiance did not surprise her, her daughter had always been mostly dragon in the same way Laner had always been a seahorse, if only she could temper it with wisdom. Laner said that father was offering me to him like a piece of meat to a starving dog. Damn it all. How could she refute something that wasn't wrong? Corlys had better have a good explanation for trying such a boneheaded scheme. That Damon would want the girl was a given fact, he would want her badly enough to start yet another dispute with his useless brother, for all the good it would do Lena, who would be caught in the middle. Trapped in marital limbo again. Your father offers you to no one. Prince Damon is married and unlikely to be granted an annulment by the king. 
I would hope you remember that whilst aiding your father. Lena's face screwed up as she digested that. It would be good to remind her that for all Laner and Renera's scaremongering she was, ostensibly, being sent to aid her father and securing their family's future by doing so. The king does not grant the annulment. Surely that is the High Septon. Oh my girl, my sweet girl, how can you be so clever and so blind to how the world works at the same time? How can he expect you to survive Damon? How can you have traveled so far and yet be so ignorant? Damon will eat you alive. Mother's mercy, Renera is right. He'll use you up and leave you a ruin. The High Septon wouldn't dare grant an annulment if King Viserys does not wish it. She snorted. The High Septon does not shit in the morning without King Viserys' permission. At least the useless lump understood that much. That the faith was a tool of the throne and not the other way round. Her daughter shifted at the casual destruction of her understanding of the world. She wanted to take her by the shoulders and shake her. She traveled as far as Volantis, rode the last of Conqueror's dragons and had the temper to match. How could she not understand? I. I believe I understand. I will fly to Bloodstone and aid father in routing these new foes. Ah, there it was. The look her girl got when she thought of adventure. Then she frowned. I just. I will miss Laner, Joff and Renera. They will be here when you get back. Lena's face cleared and she smiled. And you will remain out of the prince's way. Renera is right in saying he will want you. You do not like Renera much, asked her daughter after a while of silence, coiling her hair around her finger and looking thoughtful. To hear Laner speak of her, she's the second coming of the seven who are one. I merely think she overestimates herself. In truth, she was about the best that she could ask for in a good daughter. Pretty, clever enough and able to put her grandchildren on the throne where they belong. Laner believes she can see the future. Lena said, watching her carefully. She snorted, Laner had once been convinced he'd met a man that could walk on water. He says she knows things she shouldn't. She watched the paper that lay on her desk as one might watch a live viper and toyed with her glass of wine. She didn't need to read it to know what it said, she'd read through it enough to know the words by heart now. Empty-headed fool. What was he thinking? She knew of course. He was arrogant enough to not realize he'd lost control of the situation long ago. That everyone involved would dance to his tune. She took a sip of wine and glared at the fire in the grate. She had never danced to his tune and woe betide him if he thought she would not catch on to his game. That he would try and sell their daughter, their only daughter, to such a man. Oh he used such coy language opining it would be good for them to meet and that Renera's influence had to be fought and so on, playing to what he knew to be her insecurities. The wine glass came down to hard on the table, splashing its contents over her hand. Did he think her a fool? Did he think he could control Damon the way he thought he could control Laner and Lena? He couldn't even control the daughter of that bleeding sheep on the throne, how could he think he could control a true dragon? In truth, he couldn't even control their children anymore. Her boy, a boy no more, married for nearly a year now. He'd been to war, fought and killed. He was out in the world making his own name, forging his own legend. That he was doing at the side of that girl was the only infuriating part. She seemed content to sit back and let her precious boy sow all the hard work. Money for an army, bat your eyelids at Laner. Money for bizarre experiments, earn it on your back from Laner. And as for the spies on Driftmark. Stupid boy. Why had he not warned them that Lon Mouth, another ungrateful bastard, had men crawling over the island? Her husband had taught Joffrey everything he knew, treated him like a second son, and he repaid them with betrayal. More to the point, why had she been such a fool to assume that after that stunt her husband had pulled with their spies that Renera would not return the favor? That Laner had not told her galled her. His wife had bought out half his island and he had not cared to even try and even hint about them. Too much like his father, she supposed, all Renera had to do was play the wounded doe and Laner had done the rest. Cunning. Clever. It should reassure her that their future queen had a brain in her head. She sighed. She was being too harsh on the girl. To wound up, to worried for her children. She was seeing threats in every corner. Renera wasn't that bad. By her side, Laner had become something more. Gone was the cowering boy, afraid of everything. Now he was a man in truth, soon to have babes on the way with any luck. A knock on the door roused her from her thoughts. Come in, she barked, placing her wine glass to the side and wiping her hand on the black tunic she wore. Lena appeared in the doorway, 
looking worried and she gave her a warm smile. Come in, girl, come in. She poured them both some wine and waited as her daughter made herself comfortable before handing her the cup. Thank you mother. I wanted to speak to you about, about the stepstones, her voice was hesitant, as if she expected her to end the conversation there and then. I don't think I should go. It doesn't feel right and Laner sighed dash. Laner might as well be one of those fancy mimic birds from the summer islands right now. Renera doesn't want to risk you bringing Damon back to Westeros. Her daughter flushed at the rebuke. Lena certainly approved of the girl as well. She hadn't seen her daughter so keen to stay in one place since she'd been a child, since she'd clambered across the back of Vagar and claimed the gargantuan beast for her own. Renera said he would want me because I'm beautiful and he likes to possess beautiful things. The defiance did not surprise her, her daughter had always been mostly dragon in the same way Laner had always been a seahorse, if only she could temper it with wisdom. Laner said that father was offering me to him like a piece of meat to a starving dog. Damn it all. How could she refute something that wasn't wrong? Corlys had better have a good explanation for trying such a boneheaded scheme. That Damon would want the girl was a given fact, he would want her badly enough to start yet another dispute with his useless brother, for all the good it would do Lena, who would be caught in the middle. Trapped in marital limbo again. Your father offers you to no one. Prince Damon is married and unlikely to be granted an annulment by the king. I would hope you remember that whilst aiding your father. Lena's face screwed up as she digested that. It would be good to remind her that for all Laner and Renera's scaremongering she was, ostensibly, being sent to aid her father in securing their family's future by doing so. The king does not grant the annulment. Surely that is the High Septon. Oh my girl, my sweet girl, how can you be so clever and so blind to how the world works at the same time? How can he expect you to survive Damon? How can you have traveled so far and yet be so ignorant? Damon will eat you alive. Mother's mercy, Renera is right. He'll use you up and leave you a ruin. The High Septon wouldn't dare grant an annulment if King Viserys does not wish it. She snorted. The High Septon does not shit in the morning without King Viserys' permission. At least the useless lump understood that much. That the faith was a tool of the throne and not the other way round. Her daughter shifted at the casual destruction of her understanding of the world. She wanted to take her by the shoulders and shake her. She traveled as far as Volantis, rode the last of Conqueror's dragons and had the temper to match. How could she not understand? I. I believe I understand. I will fly to Bloodstone and aid father in routing these new foes. Ah, there it was. The look her girl got when she thought of adventure. Then she frowned. I just. I will miss Laner, Joff and Renera. They will be here when you get back. Lena's face cleared and she smiled and you will remain out of the prince's way. Renera is right in saying he will want you. You do not like Renera much, asked her daughter after a while of silence, coiling her hair around her finger and looking thoughtful. To hear Laner speak of her, she's the second coming of the seven who are one. I merely think she overestimates herself. In truth, she was about the best that she could ask for in a good daughter. Pretty, clever enough and able to put her grandchildren on the throne where they belong. Laner believes she can see the future. Lena said, watching her carefully. She snorted, Laner had once been convinced he'd met a man that could walk on water. He says she knows things she shouldn't. I apologize, your grace, I did not mean to disparage Ser Joffrey but he does remind me of Laris at times beyond the um, limp, she said quickly before forging on as she noted the frown on my face. They're both quiet men and work well in the background, they shun accolades and glory and they're both very intelligent. My apologies then, Sarah. I did not mean to overreact. I relaxed back in my chair and Sarah shot me a grateful smile before noticing her lack of wine and starting argument with her sister over the theft. My eyes were drawn back to Maris who wore a triumphant smile, she raised her wine glass in a mock toast, eyes twinkling in amusement. I'd clearly fallen prey to whatever trap she'd laid out. Concerning. Oh. But what about Ser Hugh? Ser Hugh. Red Hugh. He looks like a nervous rabbit. I tuned out the laughter and gossip about boys and allowed myself to enjoy the wine. A fruity blend from the reach that, surprisingly enough, hadn't passed through red wine hands before making its way to Dragonstone. Don't think I haven't noticed the price of Arbor Red going up Alicent because I have and I want you to know it's extremely petty. The arrival of a knight in Targaryen livery startled the ladies from their gossip. Your Grace, Princess Helena wishes to see you. 
I put aside my wine and bid my ladies farewell, dismissing them to find some sort of gainful occupation elsewhere before making my way to Helena's room. My little sister had not been sleeping well of late so I'd given her a day free. Her attendants told me she frequently awoke screaming and crying from nightmares she refused to describe to anyone, even me. It was a concern but unless she actually confided in me, I could do nothing to help. She was in bed when I arrived, bound in a cocoon of bedding and pale as a ghost. When she noticed me, she wriggled free with a cry and threw herself into my arms with a sob. I curled her close and murmured reassurances in her ear. They are just dreams, Helena, they can't hurt you. I told her in the most gentle voice I could. She shuddered against me and clutched at my mantle. You will not tell me what you dream of? I asked. I felt her shake her head against my shoulder and I sighed. I can't, she sniffled. Then at least tell me no one is harming you or making you feel unwelcome here. I was fairly certain that wasn't the case. The castellan had assured me Helena's attendants were polite and well-trained and that her knights were the epitome of chivalry and ready to guard her from any knaves. I believed it, her knights were the greenest greens. If they could spot something they could attribute to me they'd do it an instant. She pulled back from my shoulder, reddened eyes wide. No. I mean, no one hurt me. It's just. The nightmares, I finished as she trailed off, looking glum. She nodded and I sighed. Well, I suppose we will have to find something for you to do then so that you do not think of them. Meet me in the yard for practice. Helena's eyes lit up at that and she nodded. An hour later we stood in the practice yard. It was normally reserved for knights that wished to spar and keep their skills sharp or for those training squires but it was all but abandoned in the midday sun with most preferring the evening or morning time. The master of arms, Roga Langward, was still present though and was quick to fetch both mine and Helena's bow for practice. It seemed we'd be getting his full attention today, a step up from the quick tips he gave me when I accompanied Laner here. Helena was quite the shot for a nearly six-year-old and most people agreed that she'd be terror in hunting grounds everywhere when she was old enough. At the moment though she was limited to the least powerful bow in existence and only being allowed near arrows when someone halfway responsible was around. My own ability, well let's just say it was improving. Slowly. I could hit the broadside of a barn if I concentrated. I was much better with throwing daggers. Another weapon I'd begun practicing with, albeit less publicly than the bow. After being absolutely helpless against Viserys, Joffrey had suggested it might help if I trained in some kind of self-defense. Don't get me wrong, I couldn't pull a knife on the king but anyone else was fair game and that included any near duels and cutthroats that slipped through Joffrey's surprisingly extensive nets. The dear man had even gone out of his way to acquire a harness that allowed me to wear multiple knives under my dresses. Are you going to shoot too? asked Helena and I realized I'd been staring off into space for the last five minutes whilst my younger sister had fired a good few arrows into the area surrounding the center of her target. I readied myself and let an arrow fly at my own before strangling the instinctive curse as it struck the hay bales behind. Alison would have my head if her only daughter came back to court swearing like a sailor. Your grace, you're still much too tense when lining up your shot. Remember the breathing I taught you? Rogas told me in his calm and deep voice. Put the bow down and show me the exercises. I did as I was told and when he was happy he'd ironed out any poor practice, he returned the bow and ordered me to fire again. This time the arrow at least hit the target, barely. Helena gave a cheer at the improvement. Roga hummed for a moment and then moved up next to me. Try again your grace, keep an eye on the target, no, not the arrow, you are looking at the arrow, look at what you want to shoot. By the end of the session he'd ironed out several mistakes I kept making and drilled me until I could assume the correct posture and breathing required without thinking about it. He'd also strongly suggested I set aside time every day for him to work on my skills with him. Helena's eyes had lit up and I'd given in. She was proud of her skill with the bow and it wouldn't hurt to have her improve alongside me with proper instruction. Plus the only time she seemed truly free from her nightmares was with a bow in hand. When I finally escaped, my arms ached as if I'd been lifting weights the entire day and my fingers felt raw but on the upside I could hit the target 9 times out of 10 now and Helena's smile was wider than I'd ever seen it. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye-bye.